Good afternoon, everyone, and a big welcome to all of you. My name is Jeff Shutram, and I'm a trustee of the Lizard Island Reef Research Foundation. Thank you for joining us, and a particular thank you to our patrons and donors. A warm welcome also to supporters of the Centre for Policy Development, who have joined us perhaps for the first time as well. Many of you are aware of the work of our foundation, which supports scientific research at the Australian Museum's Lizard Island Research Station and elsewhere on the Great Barrier Reef. If not, I encourage you to learn more on our recently upgraded and very beautiful website. We've all joined today from different parts of the country, and I'd like us to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we all are right now and pay our respects to elders past and present. It saddens me that historical records have too many gaps for me to name the first people of the land I'm on right now. I sense the cost of our historical destruction every time I do an acknowledgement of country. It's a reminder of how important it is to look after what remains of our heritage. And this care for what remains comes through in the words of Darko Cotteris, a scientist who recently visited the research station at Lizard Island. He said to me, as taxonomists, we are trying to read a book that is on fire. And Darko is passionate about the urgency of his work in the context of climate change. And I'm delighted that the Australian Museum is doing a lot to speed taxonomic work along. Their scientists have been involved in describing 200 new species in the last year alone. This is an extraordinary effort to read that burning book. Last month, Professor Leslie Hughes spoke in this forum, setting out the destructive potential of climate change. She made it clear that a carbon budget consistent with the survival of the Great Barrier Reef will be exhausted within the next decade or two. This is an existential issue for Lizard Island and the research station. So today, we're joined by two very special people who have had a vital role to play in ensuring that we are well informed about climate change, about its consequences, and about the steps that can, that must be taken to preserve coral reefs and other ecosystems. We're very fortunate to have Professor Terry Hughes joining us to speak with the authority of unmatched first-hand experience about the state of the Great Barrier Reef from end to end. We're also lucky Kenzie with us, a fellow at the Centre for Policy Development, who has decades of experience with climate change policies and their communication. We've asked both Terry and Kate to share with us on the urgency to act on climate change and the adequacy of the actions being proposed today. How do we cut through the complexities and the distractions to know which actions are appropriate and which are not? Anne Hoggart, one of the station's directors, is also joining us from Lizard Island to participate in today's Q&A. She's another person with decades of experience observing changes to the reef and someone who now watches each summer arrive with real concern about both bleaching and cyclone activity. At this point, I'll hand over to Chris Helgen, who will formally introduce today's speakers. Chris is the Australian Museum's Chief Scientist and Director of AMRI. The Museum's Research Institute. Instead of summarising Chris's many contributions to science, I'll instead share a more personal story. I found out recently that on his first trip to Sydney, while still at university, Chris knocked on the door at the Australian Museum asking to speak with Tim Flannery about his mammal research. That says a lot about Chris, says a lot about Tim, and a lot about the Australian Museum, that the meeting happened and set in train a long-lasting and productive friendship. So, over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for the introduction for this evening's program. And it's true, that's right, I had just turned 18 years old when I uh, naively came to the door of the Australian Museum, knocked and asked if I could chat with Tim Flannery, and it did indeed set in train a wonderful series of events uh, that much later, that was many years ago, much later brought me um, back to this uh, incredible institution. Uh, it is my pleasure to serve as the Chief Scientist and Director 
of the Australian Museum Research Institute. And I am coming to you from the museum today uh, on College and William Streets. Um, I acknowledge the uh, Gadigal people as the first peoples and traditional custodians of the land and waterways on which our museum stands and also acknowledge elders past and present as Jeff has done as well. Um, thank you for being with us this evening. We have a, a tremendous lineup of, of a program and speakers. Um, we are inspired to come together as, as uh, before in some of these webinars by our joint interest in the Lizard Island Research Station. Uh, we uh, are joined by one of our directors, co-directors of the station this evening, Ann Hoggett, who will be with us, Dr. Ann Hoggett. As you know, well, many of you uh, are very familiar with the station. Founded in 1973, it has now seen well over four, approaching five decades of uh, groundbreaking, world-leading coral reef studies on our very own Great Barrier Reef. Uh, it is a premier, uh, er, uh, premier location for coral reef biology and research and understanding in particular with that long history of research how the Great Barrier Reef is changing, one of the subjects of our uh, event and discussions tonight. Uh, for 30, more than 30 of those years, Dr. Lyle Vale and Dr. Ann Hoggett have been the co-directors of that uh, station. Um, I will also just uh, introduce uh, some of our other speakers this evening. I'll also, uh, just a word about the program. Um, the the uh, presentations tonight will be uh, uh, recorded and you'll be able to see them and distribute them afterwards. We will also be having, after the speakers, a question and answer session tonight. So you will have the chance uh, from where you're viewing, uh, a question and answer box will come up. You're gonna be able to uh, enter your name and any questions that you'd like to uh, have addressed to our panel, which will include uh, our speakers this evening. Um, we're lucky to have with us, as Jeff mentioned, uh, well, here we have the three panel members, and uh, how are things at Lizard Island this evening? Very exciting, Chris. We're expecting the corals to spawn tonight, so looking forward to that. That is fantastic, and yeah, it's great to have, have you right there uh, on the reef with us this evening. Uh, welcome, uh, Anne. We're also lucky to have with us um, Kate McKenzie. And as Jeff mentioned, uh, along with her roles as a journalist and an independent consultant, uh, Kate is a, a fellow at the Center for Policy Development. She's also had a leading role at the Climate Institute. Um, as, as Jeff mentioned, decades of experience in uh, understanding, critiquing, communicating the details of climate change policy measures, especially in the Australian context. The Great Barrier Reef looms large in uh, discussions of Australia's climate change policies. And tonight, Kate will talk about Australia's history of policy responses involving the reef within the context, context of UNESCO's in danger listing of the Great Barrier Reef, which all of us have heard much about. And more recently, uh, within the context of the plan taken by Australia to COP26, the Glasgow meetings that have just happened. Uh, we'll start the evening's program with a presentation, though, from uh, Professor Terry Hughes. Um, and uh, uh, Terry is a uh, world leader in coral reef biology, as most of you will know. He is distinguished professor at James Cook University and a former director of the ARC Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies, which ran from 2005 until recently in 2020. Uh, Terry has a long list of accolades to his name. He's been elected as a fellow of the Australian Academy of Sciences. He's been well recognized uh, as a, a leading academic by the Australian Research Council, holding two Federation fellowships and a laureate fellowship, many other uh, numerous prizes and awards uh, throughout his, uh, his amazing career. Uh, through his work as director of the Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies, uh, his work has been integral to the monitoring of bleaching events in recent years on the Great Barrier Reef. We've seen uh, over the last decades and years increasing uh, numbers of bleaching events, and he continues to provide detailed insights through his work into the extent and severity of these events. 
So tonight, we're lucky to have Terry here presenting a very, very recently published work. This is his most recent scientific paper, and he's setting out the scale of existing bleaching damage and its implications for various reef recovery proposals. We're going to turn it over to uh, Terry, who's going to pose and help us uh, address the question of, will there be a Great Barrier Reef long into the future? Will there be a Great Barrier Reef um, in 2050? Uh, Terry, I'll turn, uh, turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from uh, Townsville. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to present this very brief presentation. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes. And the overarching question is on your screen there. It's a question I'm often asked. Would we still have a Great Barrier Reef in 2050? There are three uh, subsections to that. I want to discuss how the Great Barrier Reef is changing and why it's changing. The major driver is global warming. Uh, there are also issues around coastal pollution and overfishing. Those would be the number two and number three drivers of changes that have been ongoing on the Great Barrier Reef for some decades now. Uh, then I'll go on and talk about uh, what the reef might look like in 2050. The answer to that second question is yes, there will be some sort of tropical ecosystem in 2050, but whether it resembles a functioning coral reef or not depends entirely on the trajectory of global warming, greenhouse gas emissions. And to wrap up, I'll very briefly talk about whether coral restoration uh, is likely to contribute to the ongoing trajectory of the reef. A report came out overnight uh, which estimated that 258 million US dollars have been spent in 65 countries in recent years on coral restoration. The amount of coral restored by all of those projects costing about a quarter of a billion US dollars is maybe five football fields worth. Uh, to put that in context, the area of the Great Barrier Reef is 70 million football fields. The Barrier Reef has now bleached five times. Uh, the first time in 1998, we saw unprecedented mass bleaching at the scale of regions of the Great Barrier Reef. We, we, we do have records of very minor bleaching prior to 1998, earlier in the 90s, in the 80s, and the 70s. If we had had a mass bleaching event prior to 1998, we would have known about it, but we didn't. Then we saw the second event four years later, then we were very lucky and we had a 14 year gap all the way out to 2016. But since 2016, we've had three rapid fire events over a period of just four years. More recently, we've had a series of relatively cool summers, uh, but it's only a matter of time before we see a sixth bleaching event sometime in the not too distant future. Two of those five events have occurred during El Nino's, the one in 1998, and the one in 2016, but we no longer need an El Nino to trigger a mass bleaching event at the scale of a big chunk of the Great Barrier Reef. We just need a record-breaking hot summer, and those are becoming more and more frequent. 1998 was the hottest year then on record, and that record, of course, has been beaten many times in more recent years. The paper that uh, uh, Chris referred to uh, came out last week and it, it includes this set of maps. So the top set show the pattern of bleaching. This is data that we've gathered from aerial surveys of the entire Great Barrier Reef. So red is bad, that's severe bleaching, and blue is good, that's no bleaching. And the maps are for 98, 2002, 2016, and 17, and 2020. The bottom set of maps show the heating exposure, which is measured with a metric called degree heating weeks. We get that information from NOAA satellites. Basically, it tells us the exposure that the corals uh, have experienced, the level of heat and how long it lasted for. Red is hot, blue is cool. And I think you can see a good correspondence between the pattern of heating in the bottom set of maps and the bleaching in the top set. We look, for example, at 2016, the northern Great Barrier Reef was extremely hot in 2016, and that's where the bleaching occurred 
in, in that year. So we now have a recent history of recurrent bleaching and we can take these maps, let's say the last three for 2016, 17 and 20, and superimpose them on each other to look at the cumulative pattern of bleaching in recent years, which is shown in this map. So red indicates parts of the Great Barrier Reef that had severe category four bleaching. That means more than 60% of the corals were white at least once in the three events that occurred between 2016 and 2020. So collectively, those three bleaching events have severely bleached category four bleaching 80% of the reefs on the Great Barrier Reef. If we include less severe levels of bleaching, categories one and two, then 80% uh, of the Great Barrier Reef uh, has had severe bleaching, uh, but 98% has had some level of bleaching. Only 1.7% of the Great Barrier Reef, this region down here, has not experienced uh, any bleaching uh, in the last um, three events. So that's important because conservation biologists put a lot of uh, emphasis in finding the hiding places. They call them spatial refuges. Uh, Ideally, you would identify where the spatial refuges are. You'd ramp up the level of protection in those areas so that they could reseed uh, the rest of the system you're focusing on that is um, more susceptible to a threat like um, global warming. But this small region is too small, it's too far away, and it's downstream from most of the rest of the Great Barrier to act as a refuge. Instead, we rely on uh, sometimes rapid recovery uh, between one event and another one. So what's happening on the Great Barrier Reef in recent years is that it's becoming much more of a checkerboard depending on the history, the number of times a reef has bleached, and the number of years since it last bleached. That's the window of opportunity uh, that the reef has um, for re recovery. And we can show that patchiness in a couple of different ways. The map uh, on the left shows reefs with uh, whose history of bleaching is known, ranging from they've never bleached in a few reefs in the south to they've bleached once, twice, three or four times, or even five. And you can see that the frequency of recurrent bleaching is highest in the middle portion of the Great Barrier. For most reefs have bleached three or four times. Elsewhere, most reefs have bleached twice uh, with, a, with a varying uh, number of years uh, of gap between the first and the second bleaching event. So it's a checkerboard of different histories. And we can show that in this other map on the right in a different way where we, we've plotted the, uh, the time since the most recent event. So some reefs have most recently bleached in 2020. This swath of reefs in the south, a few have never bleached, and some have had four years or five years for recovery. So Lizard Island is in this category, and we've seen on Lizard some quite dramatic uh, rapid recovery in some locations, but much, much slower recovery in, in many other places. And that's actually quite typical of, uh, of many, uh, many reefs. So the, the patchwork consists of a number of different categories. Uh, there are some reefs that were badly damaged as long ago as, as 1998 that have yet to show any significant recovery. That's true of many coastal reefs. We have another swath of reefs that were recently damaged and are not showing much sign of recovery. Others that are damaged but in rapid recovery mode. And then we've got a handful, these ones in blue, uh, that were lightly damaged or undamaged or are now fully um, recovered. We, this is a checkerboard of ecological history that's unprecedented uh, for, the, for the Great Barrier Reef. Now, bleaching matters because when it's severe enough, it kills a lot of corals. And we showed that in 2016, where we compared this map of where the heat was, so blue is cool, red is hot, that's our satellite data from NOAA, and we measured the amount of mortality that occurred on reefs uh, over an eight-month period between March and November 2016. So red indicates a loss of corals uh, 
of 50% or more. And green actually indicates no mortality. And, and in some of these reefs in the south where it was cool, we actually saw an increase in coral cover over, over that period. But we, the point of these maps is that we are seeing um, very extensive uh, and the scale is quite frightening. The, the area of this red map is much larger than a Category 5 um, cyclone uh, would impact on the Great Barrier Reef. When bleaching occurs, the extent of bleaching and the extent of mortality, who, who lives and who dies, is actually very selective. So we talk about species that are relative winners versus relative losers. So the losers tend to be the branching staghorn corals, like this pile of rubble, um, which are easy, easily bleached and which often die afterwards. Whereas the more robust ones, the so-called winners, are slow to bleach. It's actually unusual to see a man-shaped coral like this. It's called parietes. Uh, that's as pale uh, as this one is. Uh, and usually they survive. They regain their color as the water temperature drops in, in the months um, following. So we're seeing a very rapid shift in the mix of species. And as we lose um, adult corals to bleaching events, we're also seeing an effect on the number of babies that they make. So this is a before and after bleaching uh, analysis of the number of baby corals that we find on the Great Barrier Reef. The blue and the yellow refer to brooders and spawning corals, two different reproductive types. But you can see that the size of the circles in this before bleaching map are generally much larger than afterwards. We saw about an 80% decline in the production of babies because there were fewer adults in uh, the aftermath of the 2016 bleaching. I want to just finish up by considering the arithmetic of recovery and loss and, and also restoration. You might be surprised that if you went out and count the number of corals in a square meter of, of a coral reef, that you would find about 50 corals bigger than the size of your thumb. If you included newly settled larvae, that number would likely be uh, many hundreds, if not thousands. There are 10,000 square meters in one hectare, um, 100 hectares in one square kilometers. Uh, so if you multiply this 50 per square meter up into larger areas, you, you very quickly get to eye-wateringly large numbers. So yes, we lost billions of corals due to the five recent bleaching events, but there are still tens of billions of corals still out there. And because of the selectivity of bleaching, those corals are tougher. Uh, and the mix of species is, is, is changing. So to sum all that up, um, recurrent bleaching, unfortunately, has now changed the Great Barrier Reef uh, for probably forever. It takes 100 years to replace a dead 100-year coral, and we are not going to have a 100-year gap between the fifth bleaching event that we've experienced in 2020 and the next one, the mix of species um, is changing the way in which the Great Barrier Reef is interconnected by transport of larvae has also changed dr dramatically. It's a new system that's behaving very differently from the system we're more familiar with. But tens of billions of corals are still out there. We could consider it to be a glass half full, glass half empty. Uh, I personally don't think that restoration is the answer. Yes, you can grow corals and breed corals, but only at very small scales, and it costs a fortune. Uh, I think the big, bigger challenge is to ensure the future of the tens of billions of wild corals that are already out there. We don't need to grow them and glue them on. Uh, that, that is the challenge. And the big challenge, of course, is to reduce emissions and local drivers, because if we don't deal with them, uh, growing more corals uh, won't cause the problem. This last point really uh, points to a crisis of policy and governance. And uh, I'm very pleased that Kate McKenzie will, will take up that thread in just a moment. Thanks very much. Thank you. Terry, in such a brief presentation, no one better to uh, highlight uh, 
um, those major kind of summary conclusions about impacts on the reef and uh, uh, particularly bleaching from top to bottom of the reef, the dynamics, the patterns, how the reef has changed, uh, where things stand, and uh, what's needed next. We're going to hear um, more on these topics as we uh, come to Q&A later on, but uh, now we have a chance uh, to uh, be here next and in response uh, by Kate McKenzie, who's with us this evening. Um, Terry left us with uh, a final word on the need for policy and governance as the key factors in uh, the future uh, of the reef. He left us with um, some sobering uh, statistics, but also um, some some optimism about the great extent of 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 organisms on the reef. Kate, can I turn things over to you for a discussion of policy and governance and the importance of the reef uh, in these kinds of discussions in the Australian context? Over to you, Kate. Um, thanks, Chris, um, and thanks, Terry. That's um, that was really really great um presentation of course um and it's um yeah quite a privilege to be sharing a panel um with you i um just also want to acknowledge that i'm um speaking from uh gadigal country in the eori nation um pay respects to elders past and present and um and also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded here um so um, I'm a writer, researcher, and consultant um, focused on the intersection of finance, policy, and climate change. Um, uh, I have to slightly downgrade my climate change credentials specifically from what was mentioned in the intro. Um, I've, I've probably only been working on climate for uh, a bit over a decade rather than sort of decades in plural, um, but uh, hopefully hopefully, I still have something to, um, to offer. Um, so I want to put some context around reef research generally. Um, I think that might be um, useful and sort of, um, yeah, displacing the sort of the, the significance of what Terry's research um, has found um, and that of other researchers. Um, I first spoke to Terry for a story I wrote for um, Foreign Policy magazine in 2017. Um, and I spoke with several other eminent coral reef researchers too for that story um, and some less well-known ones um, who are earlier in their career. Part of the idea um, for what I was writing about was the emotional toll of working on coral reefs um, for these researchers as, as the reefs are damaged by warmer waters. Um, but I really got, I, I learned a lot more in the course of writing that. Um, and one of those things was um, from talking to Terry in particular, was the scale of the Great Barrier Reef, um, the complexity of the ecosystem and how um, small in scale, many of the resilience projects are that are being undertaken um, relative to the, to the sheer size of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and that was, quite eye-opening for me, I think, because like most people, I had uh, heard and read um, so many stories about um, techniques to help repair coral um, and, and preserve sort of uh, coral communities. Um, so um, the bleaching that we've seen affecting the Great Barrier Reef is a big liability for a government like Australia's that remains committed to the expansion of fossil fuel use um, and that repeatedly neglects its international climate obligations. Um, there's a really interesting moment in a, a book called The Carbon Club by Marion Wilkinson, which details how President Obama's speech um, in uh, 2015 at the University of Queensland, um, which linked climate change and to the future survival of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and he ad-libbed a comment that he hoped the Great Barrier Reef would still be around um, for his daughters to see uh, when they were older. Um, the story is that, that, that those comments really incensed the Abbott government, um, which had been uh, expected or sort of urged by the administration to um, support some climate action at the G20 meeting that Australia was hosting and um, pretty much declined to do so. Um, so it's kind of an illustration, I guess, of the 
significance of the barrier reef um, in, in relation to Australia's climate policy and particularly in relation to how it sees itself um, and portrays itself um, on the international stage. Um, so um, I'll, I'll kind of elaborate a bit more on that. Um, as well as being um, a real laggard on climate policy at home, um, Australia does tend to play a destructive role in the global ambition on climate change um, in the multilateral um, process that is um, that is discussed at the COP meetings every year. Um, so you probably, many of you probably heard that India was involved in um, watering down language in the agreement that just came out of Glasgow over a week ago at the COP26 meeting um, about the need to phase out coal. Um, this was the first time that um, a COP statement had referred specifically to fossil fuels um, and the initial draft language of phasing out coal was, was changed to phasing down coal. Um, Australia was also implicated in that watering down of that um, that language. Um, as many conference delegates, I think, were, would have been aware. Um, it was actually reported um, by the Australian media, but it's not often that this kind of news gets out. Australia tends to be pretty good at uh, making those sorts of interventions under the cover of other big fossil fuel exporting countries, um, like Saudi Arabia being a good example. Um, but it's not a coincidence that Australia is one of the most frequent recipients of um, what's called the Fossil of the Day Awards that are given out each day throughout each COP um, by observers from non-government organisations. Um, so Chris mentioned the UNESCO World Heritage Committee, um, which is a really, really kind of salient thing, um, something that's happening that's going to, that's been a real problem for, from the perspective of the Australian government for a few years and will continue to be so. Um, Australia lobbied um, quite intensely ahead of the last UNESCO World Heritage Committee meeting in July um, after the International Union for Conservation of Nature scientists recommended that the reef be listed as in danger. Um, our Prime Minister publicly labelled that draft decision um, as appalling and Australia was particularly concerned, I think, not just at the recommendation of an in danger listing, um, which has been fighting for, um, for, for years, also lobbied quite intensely against um, such a decision back in 2015 um, at great expense. Um, but was also concerned at the draft decision taken by the World Heritage Committee um, that climate-related degradation um, can be the basis for an in-danger listing of a World Heritage area. Um, so that wasn't necessarily the case um, or wasn't so clearly the case before. Um, the Australian government's acutely aware that an in-danger listing would undermine its support for the expansion of fossil fuels um, and it would really be not a good look um, internationally um, and perhaps domestically as well, um, particularly when it's a government that is really wishes to continue um, approving expansion of fossil fuel extractions. Um, so it, it, that the, as I mentioned, so quite a bit of lobbying went on before that. And even if you didn't know about the lobbying that, that Australia had undertaken before that meeting, um, it would have probably been apparent to anyone who watched um, the proceedings, um, which you can view online on, um, on the World Heritage website, Australia's core argument that climate change is a global matter and that one country shouldn't be singled out for it is um, kind of wheeled out by delegate after delegate. Um, ironic. But though, because the Australian government's very well aware that the reef is not in great shape. Um, the Gabrumpa five-year, five-yearly reef outlook, um, the last one was published in 2019, um, said clearly that the reef was in a very poor and deteriorating state. Um, and it also says that climate change continues to be the greatest threat to the reef. Um, the government's also confirmed to have ensured that an annual update uh, from the Australian Institute for Marine Science um, would be released early ahead of that World Heritage Committee meeting um, because there had been no bleaching um, in the most recent summer that we had here. Um, the government could correctly anticipate that the report would identify some year-on-year -year improvement in coral health. Um, so um, an early um, a release of the report was dropped to a couple of um, newspapers which duly ran positive headlines, um, even though Ames had actually pointed out in the report that this resurgence in, in coral health would only be temporary. Um, and this is a, a kind of a, a pattern that we can see um, 
again and again, really. Um, Ames probably got off lightly because at least the report as it went out was, was correct. Um, there was some research published earlier this year by Don Driscoll from Deakin University, which was based on the survey of 220 Australian ecologists, um, conservation scientists and, and policymakers. Um, and a third of the government employees surveyed felt that they'd been subject to undue influence and more than half said they'd been prevented from publicly sharing scientific res um, research. Um, so the World Heritage Committee uh, decision was, um, or the process is really important one, um, I think a really interesting one and the, the, the significance that Australia places on it is, is kind of fascinating. Um, I did read a report, I'm not sure if it's still current, that, that, that the federal government had almost five staff dedicated just to managing that relationship um, with the World Heritage Committee in 2015. Um, and the listing itself wouldn't really, um, wouldn't kind of be the, necessarily be the devastating blow um, to something like tourism, I think that the government would, would um, would have us believe um, as Norway's representative to the committee who spoke in favour of an endanger listing pointed out that these these listings aren't a punishment. Um, she said it's how we mobilise action and preserve our heritage for future generations. Um, so Australia won a reprieve of sorts at that meeting but a site visit takes place early next year and the next um, committee meeting takes place in mid-2022. Um, so it's not clear how that will um, turn out. Um, I just want to mention the news media um, quickly because that's something I've worked in for, for quite a while. Um, that, that I did work there. I have worked in the news media um, for decades. Um, it's really important to sort of keep that context around um, the research, I think. Um, our understanding and our ability to fight climate change um, is really highly mediated or intermediated by the media. Um, it's really unfortunate, but conventional news media frameworks don't lend themselves very well to a crisis on the scale of climate change. Um, this is a really well-researched phenomenon, well, well understood problem, um, but um, it's not one with an easy solution. And um, I think it's really particularly relevant to the reef um, and to thinking about uh, scientific research about the reef. Um, novelty really matters for news media. Stories of uh, sunscreens, fans, underwater music um, for fish, robots, aquariums. Uh, these sorts of stories are, you know, obviously novel and they tend to attract um, headlines and clicks. Um, sometimes they make for nice photographs, although, um, you know, it's a, it's a general topic that's good for photographs. Um, uh, there's a risk, though, that that can sort of distract from the the biggest um, challenge, and there are several different challenges for the Great Barrier Reef. Um, but um, as Terry mentioned, and um, and as the Gibrampa report um, has made clear, um, it is the warming water that's the real that's um, the biggest threat. Um, there's another risk, of course, that news stories give the impression that the reef is dead, um, and that has happened before, and that's also pretty unfortunate. I think um, most researchers are really painfully aware that, that that's um, not very helpful um, and, and not correct. Um, so, you know, as as Terry's presentation showed, you know, the, the reef is changing, um, but it's really important to to keep in mind the the biggest challenge um, of climate change and the way the most effective way of dealing with that change which is which is to cut emissions um, to cut um, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions um, so um, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll just leave it there um, and um, actually might just make a note that it's also really great to have researchers like Terry um, who could speak to that connection between um, uh, emissions and other sort uh, sorry fossil fuels and other sources of emissions um, and the health of the Great Barrier Reef um, it's a it's increasingly a connection that's being drawn um, internationally um, in, at places like the UNFCCC in the IPCC um, that connection between burning fossil fuels and climate change has actually been a it, it's been pretty sort of hard fought to to make the connection in that policy, in that sort of public policy space, um, might seem weird because obviously scientifically the connection is very well understood. But um, making sure that that that, that connection is understood at a at the sort of um, policy level is is just has just been 
really, really vital. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thanks. So thank you very much, Kate. Uh, very much appreciated that insight into the, the nature of the policy response that's in place at the moment to deal with the distressing situation that uh, Terry's described previously. It's also really important, I think, to hear about the, the way in which it becomes a challenge to, to manage an understanding of the importance of different uh, pieces of research and how they are being described in terms of their consequences for our ability to adapt to climate change or the resilience of the reef climate change and how we weigh up whether or not they are insights that will scale or deliver some degree of resilience that change our view on the trajectory of the future of the reef or not. So thank you very much, Kate. I'd like to open it up now to uh, a Q&A. We have about 20 minutes left of uh, tonight's uh, gathering and I'd like to be able to open this up to a set of questions from uh, the audience for our speakers including Anne Hoggett who is uh, as I said before joining us from Lizard Island. So I've got a uh, first question from one of the other trustees of the foundation Greer who's thanked all of you for your presentations and is asking Professor Hughes or Terry Hughes, in spite of there being less baby corals from depleted reefs, are they more likely to settle successfully due to the decreased comp competition? Oh, that's, an, that's an interesting question. Um, it, it may be the case on some reefs, but probably not on others. So when baby corals are ready to settle, so they've been in the water dispersing for, uh, in the case of brooders, about 24 hours for spawners, maybe a week. So they've, they've been transported to a, a reef and they sniff out the substrate to see if it's suitable for settlement and then they glue themselves onto it. In the first few days, they have very high mortality because they're susceptible to all sorts of sources of, of mortality. They can be very easily smothered by sediment so near shore reefs that have a problem with runoff of sediment from rivers um, generally have very poor settlement of larvae. And that's the, been the case for many, many decades. Also, if a reef has uh, added nutrients that can promote growth of seaweed, we're lucky in Australia in that there are no fisheries, either commercial, recreational or subsistence for herbivorous fish that um, control algae and many other reefs around the world. We see algal blooms on reefs that are often polluted and or overfished. And, and that makes it much more difficult for, for coral larvae um, to settle. So the, the short answer is it depends on the circumstances. This is one area where we see an interaction between climate change that's killing the corals and uh, other anthropogenic impacts like pollution and overfishing. So uh, it's, it's often a mix of those three that we need to worry about to secure a future for reefs. Thank you, Terry. And I'm gonna take the uh, moderator's prerogative and uh, ask a question of my own because it's a very special week this week up at Lizard Island with the annual coral spawning taking place. I was just wondering, Anne, if you would be able to take a moment to talk briefly about the coral spawning research that's being done at Lizard Island this year. I know there are some pretty enormous uh, projects going on at the moment. Yeah, it's really just one, uh, Jeff. We've um, got a big group here doing a coral reef restoration project. Um, they're here to collect the natural coral spawn. They put it into floating pools in the lagoon, grow it up until they're at a stage ready to settle onto the reef, and then they spray it onto uh, degraded areas of reef. Um, this is not actually trying to restore the corals at Lizard Island per se. It's uh, more um, trying to prove the concept so that it can be used at other times in future. Um, as you say, it's a very, very expensive project. They've got um, 13 people staying here at the research station. They've got another 15 on a very large boat uh, moored in the lagoon here. Um, the thing that concerns me about projects like this is, as you say, um, Kate, 
the publicity about them. It is so photogenic. You know, there's wonderful photographs of them doing this. We hear all the great stories about how wonderful this is going to be. Um, you don't hear the failures um, and you don't hear, you know, when these projects fall into disrepair. I mean, a few years ago, there were all these wonderful stories about fans blowing up cool water from deep water, um, just died a natural death where you don't hear anything about it anymore. Um, a few years ago, before all this really got going, all this restoration work, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority uh, put out a draft policy for comment on how they were going to deal with these uh, restoration projects. And one, one of the things that we were very concerned about was the publicity involved. And the, we think that there should be a requirement for these projects to publish frequent updates so that people can really know actually what is happening. Because what we are here is that, yes, it's happening, it's wonderful, it's fabulous, it looks gorgeous, aren't they lucky people doing that work? And then you don't hear any more about it. Um, it's, it's really quite shocking. Um, and so I, I wish that people would hear the actual results of them. Thank you, Anne. I've got another question again on uh, reef research, this time for Terry from Peter and Lynn. What kinds of research on the reef do we need at the moment and going forward over the next decades to help us inform action to delay and buy time for the reef so that the policies that are in place can adapt and address the underlying problems better? Okay, uh, I guess I'm a little uneasy with the the um, insinuation, if I can use that word, in the question that the clever scientists can fix the problem um, when the problem is actually a political and economic and social one, uh, you know, with all sorts of ethical issues uh, as well. Let me let me try and explain that. Um, uh, I, I think the research urgency at the moment is getting a better understanding of how the altered Great Barrier Reef Mark II uh, is behaving because everything we thought we knew about how the Great Barrier Reef works is is changing rapidly. We, we, ha we have to uh, we have to relearn how the reef works. We, we have to know the consequences of the shifts in the mix of species that's occurring. Uh, we have to know how rewiring the Great Barrier Reef in terms of where larvae are produced and where they're transported to. It's different now than, than it was um, uh, just 10 years ago. Um, and it will change uh, increasingly in the future. The Barrier Reef is on a trajectory driven primarily by global warming. That trajectory started in 1998. Uh, we've been studying it for 20 years. Uh, so global warming is not something we can buy time for. We're halfway along this trajectory. Um, the, the phrase buying time is often used by people who undertake restoration projects. And as Anne indicated, the failures of those projects uh, don't lend themselves to uh, the sort of media coverage um, that Kate um, referred to. And the basic problem with coral restoration is if you don't fix the reason why the corals declined in the first place, then history will repeat itself. So yes, you can add plant and grow corals after the last bleaching event, but it will happen again. Uh, and, and so you're not buying time. Um, some would argue you're giving the false impression that the clever scientists can fix the problem. Uh, it's not just a problem of scientific knowledge, it's a problem of um, inappropriate policies uh, slow action on climate change, uh, and, and that, of course, is a much broader issue than just what should the scientists do. Okay, that's a, that's a heavy answer. <laughs> Very much appreciated. I have, I have another question here for uh, Kate this time. Uh, given increased frequency of bleaching events that we've observed, how should we be splitting our resources that the capabilities and the, the funding we've got available to, to make changes, policy changes to climate change? How should we split those resources between creating climate change resilience and between preventing the problem in the first place? 
looks like Kate, you're muted. That's excellent. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so um, in terms of coral reefs specifically, um, I did, you know, I defer to Terry and Anne on that, but um, I, I think generally from all the sort of research and, uh, um, and, and so forth I've done into the cost of adaptation, um, it's not something that is very well understood. Um, generally the costs are much uh, look like being much higher than we could really um confidently anticipate um and, and simply because it's pretty hard to anticipate you know what a, what a warmer um climate is going to to do i mean we can can anticipate some of it um but you know the climate is um of the atmospheric and ocean oceanic climates are, are, are pretty sort of fundamental to a lot of the the way that human society is these days um and, and always has been, of course. So yeah, I don't know. I think I think you know, my, my it's a really tough one because there are lots of communities and ecosystems that are already, you know, that are very vulnerable to climate change, and obviously we need to support them. I, I think um, I've been looking a lot lately at um, the difference um, in sort of options between the uh, in financing options between global north and global south countries um, and um, you know, funding for adaptation is a lot harder to get hold of for global south countries, um, particularly for the lower middle income, lower income countries. And um, and it's a particular problem for um, small island states um, as well, who have, you know, tend to have a really small, you know, pretty small economies, um, often quite exposed to things like tourism and, and disproportionately big threat and cost from the impacts of climate change. So. Yeah, I, I just I don't really know. I think I think the answer really depends on um, where you're talking about um, in terms of the balance between adaptation and mitigation. But um, uh, certainly, you know, prevention is is better than than cure with with climate. It's quite it's it's quite obvious. Um, but yeah, we can't we can't forget about adaptation because that um, that's a real equity issue um, for one thing. Thank you, Kate. I've got another question from Greg again for Terry. Are the least impacted reefs in the southern reaches also at a greater depth, or is this just a latitude advantage? What, do, what is it that's preserving those reefs that are protected at the moment? Uh, it's, it's likely to be the movement of cooler water. So the southern offshore reefs have um, upwelling of cold water um, onto the reef, which um, so far has occurred during all five bleaching events. There are other parts of the outer reef in the central barrier reef and northern barrier reef that also have upwelling uh, but it failed uh, it was too intermittent uh, during some of the, one or more of the previous bleaching events it's not depth and it's not a latitudinal advantage when we look at our temperature maps those are anomalies uh, the the degree of heating above the normal summer maximum temperature for that latitude so the south is cooler but we're looking at the temperature difference uh, between the long-term average uh, versus these marine heat waves that trigger the different bleaching events. It may be that the southern reefs will bleach in the sixth event, that they've just been lucky five times, uh, or it may persist um, due to that uh, particular oceanography of that small portion of the reef. That's interesting. It's always a more complex answer. <laughs> so I, I have one more question that relates more broadly to policy. And that, that is how, that's a question from Alan about how we as a community should try to influence policy. What's the right levers to be trying to maneuver? Is voting and supporting community lobbying the right way to go? Or are there other things that we should be actively pursuing? Oh, um, shall I answer that one? No, you're up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, it's, again, really hard question. Really depends on, um, I guess, sort of who you are and and, and what, um, like, what what your uh, sort of influence is. Um, I think um, uh, I think for, for you know at, by in general, I think yes. You know, voting obviously is really really important, um, and um, and and. Uh, you know, being engaged like with the community, you know, with your community as much as you can um, to to uh, you know help other people, you know, help help your sort of 
peers and community understand the importance of it and 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 yeah just be more aware i mean it's very easy for people to just not think about climate change i think um still um in a lot of the time um uh and you know because it's it's pretty you know scary and depressing thing to think about sometimes um and um, um lots of people would just rather not um so i think you know it's yeah find, finding ways to sort of ensure that people are across it would it helps um i do a lot of work um I've, I've done a lot of work focused on the private financial sector um and a, a question that comes up a lot is you know like the, the, there's a it's a big question there about you know how can finance be more effective if you sell your shares in fossil fuel companies someone else buys them and what does it all mean and what you know what what really has impact um but one of the things in, in corporate world that i think does have a lot of impact uh, is, is pretty unquestionable is um funding of um industry um lobby groups and the policy positions that they that they take um and intervening you know withholding funding or or ensuring that the positions um of those groups improve um that, that's that's where a lot of stuff um breaks down i think in the political landscape in australia and, and quite a few other countries as well um is is at that um level of um of lobbying of um of industry lobbying um so yeah i think that that's always a good one to keep an eye on if if that is you know if, if that's something that you've got access to um but you know it re yeah really really depends um just generally people using their platform and influence is is helpful i think where they can thank you kate so time is running away from us to wrap up, I'd just like to ask a very brief question to both Terry and Kate. In your last minute, is there an acid test that can be applied to the solutions that are being put forward to climate change? How do we see past the smoke and the mirrors, all of the obfuscation that is put forward in a policy context to see what is going to be workable and what is not? Terry first, perhaps. Yeah, well, the number one driver uh, for what most people would regard as the degradation of the Great Barrier Reef uh, over, over time is climate change. What we really need to see is for temperatures to stabilize uh, as soon as possible and for them not to go too high. So the Paris targets of 1.5 to 2 degrees, I think 1.5 would be doable in terms of the capacity of the Great Barrier Reef uh, to, to adapt. Things will get worse before they get better. We talk about coral reefs running the climate gauntlet. And if I can mix my metaphors, uh, that means there's light at the end of the tunnel. But we really need the temperature to stabilize at something close to 1.5. That tr translates into 0.45 degrees centigrade in the tropical ocean of further warming. Um, the 1.3 of global average warming we've seen so far has obviously been highly stressful for the Great Bear Reef. They've triggered the five bleaching vents we've seen, but the reef is still there. There's still tens of billions of now uh, somewhat chastened and tougher corals uh, than before uh, 1998. So we have a window of opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the policy uh, of the Australian government. Uh, so perhaps the best solution for the Great Barrier Reef would be to change the government. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. And Kate, you've got a 30 seconds. Let um, us know what you're in. I don't think I can say, I, I don't think I can really add to that, actually. Um, I, I, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a perfect um, statement, really. So, yeah, I, I think obviously, like, there's probably some roles for, for, for other measures, but really, like, it's amazing how sensitive these ecosystems are to, to, to warming, to climate change. And, you know, if, if really, if, if sort of people working in and around coral reefs can sort of keep that in mind, it, it might be the way that we can protect other ecosystems too by just, you know, by the, by the fact that, like, you know, places like the Great Barrier Reef are so so precious and so wonderful and, 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 are, and are also just so incredibly vulnerable to um to climate change so yeah we really really need to do everything we can to limit global global warming to to one and a half thank you very much kate and thank you terry thank you everybody as well for your excellent questions really appreciated the questions themselves and the answers that have been given terry thanks for your passion for sharing your latest research about the degraded state of the Great Barrier Reef, and depressing as it is, providing some hope 
for the future, as it were, running the gauntlet. And also thank you for your ongoing work campaigning for meaningful action to turn this situation around. I witness it on social media all the time, and I know there's a lot of work that's going on in the background behind that. And Kate, thank you also for helping us to place the state and the future of the Great Barrier Reef within a broader policy context. Your perspective on the implications of COP26 and Australia's policy response in particular is insightful and concerning. So tonight we've covered a lot of ground. It's, a, it's an area that I'm pretty passionate about. Having lived from 1970 through to now, I feel like I've seen the arc of this degradation process on the reef and I'm looking for it to work out well. So the scale of the challenge is immense and the urgency to transition to zero net emissions economy is much greater than that built into Australia's current plans. I think that's very clear from the presentations tonight and the discussion subsequently. So Kate and Terry, thank you very much on behalf of all of us. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for your ongoing engagement in this effort that can often feel very daunting. Thank you also to Anne for joining our Q&A. It's, it's great to get updates from the research station. And I really hope we haven't kept you away from the annual coral spawning tonight. <laughs> Thanks also to all of you for joining us this evening. This year seems to be quickly wrapping up in a rush of webinars and Zoom conferences. We really appreciate you finding the time to engage tonight. Finally, thanks again to all of those who support our foundation so generously. It really enables the great work that continues to be done at the research station. If you want updates on that great work, I encourage you to have a look at our website. It's got a lot of details of innovative and exciting new steps that have been taken forward at the research station. As previously mentioned by Chris, this webinar is recorded and it'll be uploaded to our website if you'd like to share it with others. Thanks again for joining us and good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.